in a big team, you know, you have boxes and you fill the boxes. So in board work, it's actually more adapting the culture of the board to whoever is around. The first duty of the board is reduce value destruction. We need to, de we need to deliver, we need to drive. Even if, you know, even if we made mistakes, let's keep, let's keep going in. So welcome to Kiev. And uh, my first question is uh, funny because uh, 1979, you got your PhD in Yale University. That's exactly the year where, when I was born. During this time, what was your biggest input to the academical management? What was your main discovery? First, thank you, Andre. Uh, it's a big question and reminds me how old I am. So uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I think the biggest discovery is that uh, as you go to the top, the tools must become simpler. Simpler. Simpler, because uh, people don't have much time. The problems are very complex and if you add complex tools to complex problems, you get lost in complexity. And I would say that is the disaster of the financial crisis, which is there was so much complexity in finance that everybody lost control, including the academics who had contributed to the new innovation and the new financial instruments. So that was my uh, lesson. And that's what I now apply in my teaching at the board level or at the senior executive level is uh, trying to do in management what I actually sort of learned as an engineering student. The great engineer uses tools, but then customizes the tools to his or her context. What is the most important tool if you have a chance to choose only one? Oh, I think the, the most important tool is, is uh, fair play. Is, uh, not charisma, it's not power. The higher you, the more you go up in companies, the more you must be fair play. And uh, this is a big contrast with fair share, which is uh, people uh, either are fair play or they're driven by uh, shares, you know, get a bigger share of the, of the income, of the revenue, of the salary. And if you go for fair share, you become unfair play. But by fair share, you mean eat what you kill or... Yes, or no, it's, it's or basically what do you eat? What is my share? Uh, some people eat what they don't kill. It's what other people kill, you know? So, so fair play is actually trying to enforce that, you know, uh, maybe what you eat is, is maybe being killed by others. The hunters uh, would actually hunt and they would actually share with other hunters. And one of the reasons is because maybe tomorrow or the other day, I don't bring anything from the hunt. So I share, when I hunt a lot today, I share with you. Tomorrow, you may be luckier than me, then you share with me. So there's always in life this interplay between f fair play and fair share. Cool. And what it means for you to be a great leader in business, in, in entrepreneurship? Oh, I think uh, great leaders have a vision. So they see something that other people don't see. So I think the visionary side, they see a business opportunity, they see a challenge, they see a solution. You know, I think entrepreneurs are people who don't necessarily entreprendre, like they say in French, which is they take, but they first see things. Now, sometimes they see wrong, uh, but I would say the thing I find amazing is some people see things that other people don't see. And that's what I respect the most in business. If you take the classical journey of entrepreneur who is coming from his idea, then the startup mode, then a company, then maybe a corporation. What is the crucial mistakes people do on every stage? Uh, not listening. So not listening, too much perseverance, too much thinking you know and not adapting to the, the context. The saddest thing about entrepreneurship is that actually most entrepreneurial ventures succeed when they kick out the founder. And they kick out the founder not because he's bad, it's just that he's unwilling to yield, he's unwilling to go to the middle, he's unwilling to adjust. He was a very stubborn person. Maybe he did you know, 15 years of entrepreneurship and he feels that he's now successful, he doesn't need to listen because if he had listened, he wouldn't have been an entrepreneur 15 years later. So this duality between perseverance, which I need, 
Because if, if you're not perseverant, you're not an entrepreneur. Because if it's easy, then everybody does it. There's no entrepreneurship. So you must be perseverant, but you can't become stubborn. And the sad thing is at some point, perseverance becomes stubbornness. And at that point, there should be an alarm bell and say, it's time for you to change. It's time for you to listen to others. Because otherwise, entrepreneurs need capital, need money. And the entrepreneurial venture doesn't necessarily generate enough capital. If you have enough capital, retained earnings, you can do whatever you want. You can destroy. This is Elon Musk. But Elon Musk had a, you know, a lot of money, which he put into the car business. Now he doesn't have enough money. And what made Elon Musk great as an entrepreneur was actually using his own, also using his own finance. But now he needs to compromise. And this is actually quite difficult for him, as it is for any great entrepreneur. I mean, Steve Jobs was fired twice from Apple. Most people say this was not so bad because when he was fired, he developed Next. And Next became sort of iTunes or, you know, other, other things. But there, there probably was a better way for Steve Jobs to adjust, accommodate, to have difficult discussions inside Apple and not to be fired. So you're in business of management for about 40 years. How globalization and digitalization have changed things? First, the globalization has really been, as Joe Santos says, nailed by digitalization. Is that the digitalization was a tipping point and it made the global world very fast, uh, very violent, uh, very much there, very much present. And I think the ultimate paradox of globalization is that uh, <coughs> uh, in the global world, you know, the people who, who actually won are not the people we thought we would win, which is the, the Western advanced economies have not won. Many of them are in trouble, France, you know, UK, uh, US now. But the great winners of the uh, globalization game are the emerging markets, China, Singapore, Africa is still sort of lagging, but uh, the winners are not, are not the winners we thought they were. We thought the big countries, the advanced economies would win. And in that sense, Ukraine could be a winner of globalization because with digital and global technologies, uh, Ukraine can both attract foreign capital and foreign talent and also export to the rest of the world. So. I find the duality between global and local very interesting. And, and uh, the final conclusion is, in the global world, you must be global and local, not just global or not just local. If you're just too local, you lose opportunity. If you're too global, you don't have roots. So you must actually be present in markets and, and apply differentiation of your offer according to the local geographies, countries, you know, cultures that you meet. How do you think owner of the company uh, or CEO should approach change and innovations in this accelerated world? Yes, I think in the accelerated world, it's going to be uh, a team play. I think the world is becoming more complex. And to think that like before, one owner or one founder or one CEO can have all the answers I think it's delusions. Companies will become more collaborative. Uh, on the internet, you cannot do anything alone that is constructive. You need supply chains, partnerships, so you cannot work alone. So I think the good news of the digital world is, is going to be more collective, more collaboration. And I think solo players will have difficulty because the only thing you can do by yourself, and, and maybe not even, is be a nuisance. So you can actually you know, insult people. Uh, you can try to... Uh, you know, maybe spy, uh, even cybersecurity is not one person, you know, it's sort of, uh, you, have the, you have a team behind. But um, the global world and the future world is still a big question mark. That's the most fascinating, which is we don't really know where we're going. And maybe we know even less where we're going than, you know, what we knew before. It could be now that things are accelerating so much that uh, you have to sort of plan in advance, otherwise you, you miss it. So... Uh, it's not clear that um, just reacting fast will be enough. You must make bets in advance and these bets will not, not all work out. So there'll be more risk, more bets, more failures, more learning. 
explore the future before you make a bet. Make a bet, execute on the bet, correct, because the bet will, will always be changing and, and, and never be stable. How should developing companies which are in developing markets behave themselves to use these opportunities and challenges? Well, I think they should develop and they should use, uh, they should first have a view uh, of the world, which is it could be now that the best opportunities are not necessarily in the local country, but uh, you also need to explore the opportunities in the local country, because if you are located in a country, you know that country. And the big advantage if you're a Ukrainian firm is to understand Ukraine. Ukraine is a very special country, very uh, relatively complex country, open country in some ways, closed in other ways. So the best defense for Ukraine is the complexity of Ukraine. So it's difficult for other people to come in because, you know, it's, it's, it's relatively complex. But the second part that Ukrainian development companies, and this is offered, this opportunity is offered by the global world, is look at the world. And if you develop a good service, a good offer in Ukraine, I would guess that, that you know, a few changes to that will also be very of, of great interest to Britain, to America, to France. So uh, think and act local and global is sort of what I would say. Ужасна сложная книжка. Я буду еспресо сейчас. If you can recommend three books which can have a dramatic influence on an entrepreneur, what three books will you recommend? A great book, uh, also given by a colleague of mine, actually, it was called The Three Tensions. Basically, it's about managing a different uh, opposing views. And I think The Three Tensions is a, is a fantastic book. It basically means that the great winning companies are not people who make big moves, you know, from left to right, from one extreme to the next one. But people who move, you know, in, in a little bit like a boat, you know, let's do 10 degrees, 10 degrees, another 10 degrees. Or like you do investments, you know, I invest 10%, then I invest another 10%. I never go to 100% in one. So I think that's a very useful recipe for, um, I think, the, the, the future world. Another book which I like very much is um, by Gemma Watt from Harvard. It's called Strategy is Commitment which is everybody talks about agility, but as I said before, uh, in the modern world, you need to make bets before you know whether they, they succeed. And that's, a big, that's, a, that's a, a big gamble. So I would say uh, strategy as commitment, I think is a, uh, is a uh, second book. And then I think I would, uh, I would have the, the books on uh, leadership profiles. I think it's Gardner. Uh, to understand that there isn't one leader, uh, but that everybody st has leadership talent, but we're not complete. Uh, so understanding that there isn't one profile of a leader, uh, that there are different profiles, that people are different, that different leaders are different. And I think that brings me back to uh, team play, which is you don't have it all. So don't think you have it all and you can do it by yourself. I'm Ludo van der Heijden, uh, Corporate Governance Professor from INSEAD, uh, co-founder of the uh, Ukrainian Corporate Governance Academy, and I can only say create whatever. <laughs>